properly reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word from the Lord. James Offer here with you. And as always, we're grateful for you to watch and tune in with us and study God's Word together. Here's our contact information, how you can reach me, 276-340-2653 or 336-394-5721. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address. And uh, we hope that you'll come and visit with us if you're in the area, 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. And... Uh, uh, we meet on Sundays at 10 and 11 and Thursday nights at 7 uh, for our Bible study. H23 Starling Avenue in Martinsville. I know Mark's put these information up for you before. Also, 120 American Legion in, uh, in Danville is, uh, is where the, the Saints meet there. And uh, you might have heard Mark's phone going off, which reminds me to make sure mine's turned down because I know somebody's going to try to call and and disrupt. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, stay tuned tonight for religious review uh, coming on after the after the news tonight. I think Mark and I are going to try to go on together, and uh, we'll probably have open line uh, for quite a bit. So, we're, stay tuned for religious review after the news. I know some of you uh, are staying up and watching, and we appreciate that very much. One of the things that uh, last week a lady called in, and I I know we'll be discussing uh, this call later on on Religious Review. But one of the things that was said was uh, well, the idea that we are saved by the blood. And uh, that is a very interesting discussion and it caused me to think about, you know, there's a lot of people that would say our salvation is based upon something alone. Now, if you really want to uh, understand this, we want to figure out, number one, what is separating us from God. Now, I think we all recognize that sin is the thing that separates you from God. Isaiah 59, in verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that, you're, that it's not that God cannot hear or that he cannot save. It's just that sin really is standing in the way. I'm paraphrasing there, but there it is, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God that, uh, and, his, and sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So sin is the problem. Man has sinned and driven a wedge between uh, himself and God. And so the remedy to get man back together has to do with something. And that is God's grace. Now, the thing that we all hear quite often has to do with God's grace. Everybody says saved by grace. And no doubt about that, we are saved by grace. But here's what we have to understand, friends, is that it is not grace only. We need to listen to what the Bible says about God's grace in order to understand its relationship in our salvation. How does it, how does it work in our salvation or how does it bring about salvation? Notice Ephesians 1 verse 6. For example, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. It is God's grace that actually makes us to be accepted in the beloved. Now, the beloved is Christ. The beloved is Christ. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So we are beloved or we are accepted in the beloved, in Christ. All right? But it is God's grace that brings that about. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And then in Titus 3 verse 7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So it is, it is the, the grace of God that brings salvation, the grace of God that, that justifies. It's the grace of God that uh, allows us to be accepted in Christ. But how is it that God's grace that has appeared to all men, how is it that it is uh, 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 given to us? Well, first of all, understand what grace is. It's unmerited favor. It's unmerited, uh, unmerited gift. It is an extension. It is a giving of something that is really undeserving. Now, God's grace is the answer for the sin that separates from God. And the reason is because God is a gracious God. 
So anything that God gives to people who are undeserving is a product of his grace. Now listen to this. In, uh, the, in, in Psalm 86 verse 15, the psalmist says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. It is this very characteristic of God that caused Jonah to say to God that he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Now we know the story. Jonah was told to go down, to go preach in Nineveh and tell them that in 40 days God was going to destroy the, the city. And Jonah didn't want to go and he was a, a, a very patriotic man. He knew that the, the Assyrians, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, he knew they were wicked people and he wanted to see them destroyed. Because he knew what was going to happen to, to Israel uh, if they continued. So he didn't want to go. But when he finally went, he finally wound up going, and he preached, and then they repented. And this is what he said to God. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceeding, and he was very... And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarsus, but I fled before unto Tarsus, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thou of the evil. He said, I knew you were gracious. I knew you were full of grace. I knew you would extend something to these wicked people if they repented. So he said, I knew that you were willing to forgive them. I knew you were willing to extend forgiveness to individuals who did not truly deserve it. Now, friends, that's really where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a position to where we don't deserve God's grace, but because God is a gracious God, he's going to extend grace that brings something, that actually extends something that we're undeserving of because that's the nature of God. Now, what we need to do is consider how it is that God's grace brings salvation. How is it that God's grace extends everything that we are unworthy of in order to, to make us accepted in Christ? Well, let's look at this verse. In Ephesians 2 and verse 5, I'm going to put this up on the, on the screen because I think more people can see it this way. But Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to, we're going to look at verse 4 here. This is what Paul writes. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace to his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of ourselves it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, the, the very familiar passage there is saved by grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves is the gift of God. So everybody... Uh, immediately says, well, we're saved by God's grace. Well, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Saved by grace through faith. But here's what we need to understand, friends. If we are going to say saved by grace through faith, we need to understand what is involved there. There are two things, two things that are involved in salvation, the human side and the divine side. <clears throat> now, somebody's going to say, well, the human side doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Well, I'm sorry to differ with you. The Bible actually teaches that you do have something to do with your salvation. Now, I know there's some folks out there watching. Mr. Hopkins, he likes to write in and tell us, well, no, you do nothing for your salvation. Well, but the Bible says there's something that you do in regard to your salvation. And that is where people misunderstand God's grace. They think God's grace is extended so you don't do anything. No. That's not what the Bible teaches. There are two elements in salvation, faith and grace. By grace are ye saved through faith. Now, it's not by grace are you saved. It's by grace are you saved through faith. And so there are, there are two sides there, are two, two things, two elements involved. There is a, a, a grace 
and then there's faith. Now, that's the positive side. Now, the negative side is there are some things that are not involved, not by works. All right, we'll get to that momentarily. But let's understand the two parts of uh, of, the, of the positive side, saved by grace through faith, in order to understand how God's grace works from Ephesians 2, verse 89. For by grace are you saved. For by grace are, are you saved. Now, let's notice this. Grace are you saved. When, when someone says, by grace are you saved, there's no doubt that salvation is a product of, of God's grace. It comes by grace. Titus 2 verse 11. We already read that verse. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, if you really want to look at grace, <clears throat> notice what is connected with that grace. What is connected with the grace that brings salvation? Or what is linked between grace and salvation? Romans 3 verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right? So there is justification, there's redemption that is in Christ. It's connected with grace. 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul said, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, I obtained mercy, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now notice this. Do you see the connection here? You have justification, you have redemption that is a product of God's grace. It is the, it is the end of God's grace, if you will. But, but Paul, at the time Saul, he said he was a persecutor and a blasphemer and injurious because he was an unbeliever. But it was not until and until he actually had faith that the grace was actually going to be extended to him. Now, the grace was there, but faith and grace go hand in hand. So it's not by grace only. Now, you're saying, well, James, we know what's saved by grace through faith. Yes. But everybody that quotes that verse, nearly everybody, is trying to justify saved by faith only or saved by grace only. And here's why I know that. I know that because your own manuals teach that. All right? Your own manuals teach that. Here's what the Baptist manual teaches. The Baptist manual says, We believe the scriptures teach that salvation of sinners is Holy of grace. Holy of grace. Now, friends, salvation is not holy of grace. Salvation is a product of grace, but there are a lot of other things that are connected to grace. Or to salvation, excuse me. There's a lot of things that are connected. It is not holy of grace. And the very... Uh, verse that we are discussing states that there is faith connected with the grace of God. So it can't be grace only or holy of grace. Listen, if it was grace only, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if it was grace only, holy of faith, then wouldn't all people be saved? Now that's universalism. That means that Christ died, therefore everybody is saved. And I know some of you watching out there, that's what you believe. I've talked to you. I've gotten letters from you. I've, stu I've studied with you. And you say, well, yeah, Christ appeared, <clears throat> or the grace of God appeared. Christ died for all mankind, therefore everybody saved. Now, friends, if that were true, why even mess with talking about it? Why even bring up the name of Christ if Christ died and everybody's going to be saved? It can't be universalism. It can't be that God's grace is extended to all men and therefore we're all saved. Otherwise, we would, we're just spinning our wheels. We're wasting our time. See? Because the grace of God has appeared to all mankind, that does not mean that everybody is saved 
by grace, period. It has to be that something that man does or there is something else that is involved in the receiving of that grace. The grace is extended, true enough. It's appeared to all men. But how is it that that grace then reconciles man to God? It can't just be because God's grace is extended. It has to be that man's doing something. Because notice this. Notice this. The doctrine of limited atonement. Now, we've talked about a little bit before on this, on this program. Limited atonement means that there's only a select number of people who are going to be saved. It's limited. The atonement of Christ is limited to a, a select group of people. Well, it, there's no way that that can be true if grace alone is what saves people. Because the grace of law is extended to all men. The elect, the so-called elect, and the so-called non-elect. So the, the idea of limited atonement can't be true if the doctrine of grace only is true. I submit to you that both of them are wrong. But just because God's grace has reached all men, now stay with me, does that mean that man has nothing to do with his salvation, that he plays no part in it, that he plays no role in it, that he has nothing that he uh, 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 participates in in order to cause that salvation to be activated, if you will? If that's the case, in Acts 2, verse uh, 40, the Bible says that Peter said with many of the words that he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, man has a part in it. Man has to do something. The grace of God has appeared to all men. But just the appearing or the extending of this unmerited favor or unmerited gift does not in and of itself mean that you and I are saved by God's grace. God's grace has provided the means by which we can be saved, okay? Now notice, saved by grace uh, through faith. Everything in the scheme of redemption is brought about by God's grace. Now friends, if you don't, if you don't recognize that there are some things connected to salvation that are the product of God's grace, what's going to happen is you're going to say something is not important. You're going to say something is not important because you don't realize that grace is actually connected to some of these things. For example, the God of all grace. God is the giver of all grace. 1 Peter 5.10 But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus after ye have suffered a while make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Okay? So we all recognize God is the God of all grace. And some people think, well, that's all we need. But look at this. Jesus is a part of God's grace to man. God's grace includes Jesus. Romans 5, 15. But not as of the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more by the grace of God. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. So the grace of God came by Jesus Christ. In other words, the, the grace of God is extended in the form of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm saying all this to say there are some things that are connected with the grace of God that you might discount and say are unworthy or are not included in grace that God has. Did you ever stop and think about the word itself? is a part of God's saving grace. Look at this. Acts 14, verse 3. Acts 14, verse 3. Long time therefore both they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace. If the salvation, if the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men, how do you think it's appeared? It's appeared in the form of this word right here. The word of God's grace. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither can I dear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You would not know about God's grace had it not been for his word. See what I'm saying? So when you say, well, it's by grace only, are you considering the fact that there's a whole lot of things included in the grace of God and you can't discount one of them and say it's not important? Now, friends, you may be sitting there tonight saying, well, I, I agree with you, James. Jesus is part of God's grace and God's the God of all grace and the word of his grace, that's all important. But that's what we mean by say by grace only. Well, what if I told you that the church was part of God's grace? Now, I know some of you out there say the church is not important. Oh, the church is not important. I want to be in Jesus. I don't want to be in the church. Friends, the church is part of God's grace. Notice this. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, I'm going to, I'm going to put it up here. I know that that's not uh, uh, easy to see. Well, Ephesians 3 verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. So here is the pouring out, the dispensing of God's grace to you word. What is going to be included in this dispensation of God's grace? How that I made, how about by revelation, I, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote uh, a four in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now stop there. Remember, this is part of the dispensation of God's grace, the pouring out of God's grace, the giving of God's grace that's appeared to all men, includes... The fact that the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs with the Jews in the same body. And they're going to be partakers of his promise that is in Christ Jesus. Now that promise is the promise of salvation. Now that is part of God's grace, the dispensing of God's grace. Whereof, verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, in this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here's my point, friends. Christ, excuse me, Paul is, is revealing the mystery of Christ, a dispensation of God's grace, and in it, what he is revealing is the, the, uh, uh, the manifold wisdom of God to include the church as part of man's salvation. Now, the church is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Now, if you want to say that God's grace is extended toward man and that you're saved by God's grace, well, God's grace brought about the church. It is God's grace, his a, a, a extended unmerited favor that actually is producing the church whereby, we must be, whereby we're going to be saved, in which we're going to be saved, which is the body of Christ. Ephesians 5, verse 23, the church is the body, and the body is the church. So, if the grace of God, if the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, and the grace of God has brought about the church, then the church, which is the uh, body of Christ, is part of God's salvation for man. Now, some of you are going to say, well, you know, I, I don't think that that's really part of it. Well, you, you can fight the word all you want to, friends. I didn't write the book. The grace of God is what brings salvation. And so it is by grace are you saved through faith. Now, again, there's no doubt that salvation is through faith. 
Some people say, well, y'all don't believe in salvation by grace. I believe in saved by grace. So if y'all don't believe in saved by faith, I believe in saved by faith. It's just not by grace only and it's not by faith only. But listen, the verses that we've been discussing, Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 10, many people don't understand grace through faith because they then read these verses and they think they talk about faith only. Listen to what this lady says. All right, last call. You're on. What's about? No, we actually 15, 15, 15 after. You're on what's the Bible say? I was calling with regard to your um, request for one verse um, that specifically identified being saved through faith. Faith only. I'm just going to reference Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, and then five, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you have been saved. And then in verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And okay. this is not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. Okay, ma'am, I have one that says that you're saved by the blood. Now, if I'm going to be like you, that it means only, I don't even need your grace, I don't even need your faith. Romans 5, 9. If I want to use the Bible like you're using it, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. I'm justified by blood only. Now, is that fair? I wasn't pointing to being fair. I was only addressing your you did, issue with You that. did not. You did not address it. I specifically said faith only. A.C. Smith said faith only. Only. I He's, wasn't arguing about what anybody else said. I was just bringing to, to okay. light the verse. Okay, you weren't addressing what we asked for, ma'am. I know that there are a lot of verses that say that, that we, have, uh, we have God's grace and we access it through faith, but not faith only. I agree with that. But the Ephesians, the very place you're reading, those people were baptized twice. So I know they didn't think, nor would Paul teach, that it's faith only because Paul himself was baptized for the purpose of washing away his sins. At least that's what he said when he was on trial in Acts 22. So, Right, but you specifically asked for just one verse. No, I did not, ma'am. I asked for a verse that said faith only. I'll go back and put it up there for you. It said faith only. It did not just say faith. A.C. Smith already brought up those verses. For anyone who can find the verse that says saved by faith only. He said a vast number faith only. only. Thousands faith only. You're looking for the word only. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Now, faith only. We're not, we're not denying saved by grace. Not denying saved by grace through faith. Not denying saved by faith. You're talking about only. The word only there. Now, I know that some of you, though, you may hear us say that and you may recognize, you know what? It's not by faith only. It's not by grace only. But did you know that the books that you're using, your creed books and your catechisms and so forth, your manuals, they teach only. They insert the word only or holy or, or solely. Listen to this. This is the Methodist discipline. The Methodist discipline says this. We are accounted righteous before God only for the, uh, for the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith and not for our own works or deservings. Wherefore, for that we are justified by faith only. It is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. Now, friends, that would be a, a very comforting verse. That would be a very comforting doctrine to think that you are justified by faith and that's all. All you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're saved and you're justified. Now that is a comfort, comforting doctrine. But Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith. You're actually saved with two elements there being, being uh, uh, spoken of, grace and faith. Not faith only. Now that is a wholesome doctrine, all right. But it's really H-O-L-E, wholesome. It's got a lot of holes in it. And I don't mean it's holy. It's an unholy. It's an unholy doctrine. 
It's not a wholesome doctrine. It's got more than, a, than some holes in it. It's got a lot of holes in it. It's not in agreement with the Word of God, yet right, there it is, right there in your Methodist discipline. Now, friends, I'm trying to get you to see that when you talk about your salvation, your preacher's telling you saved by faith only. Not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Now, let's go back to the, to the Baptist. The Baptist uh, manual, actually, now it's going to contradict itself. Remember, we already read the Baptist manual say that you're saved by, saved wholly by grace. But look at this. It is bestowed not in consideration of any works of righteousness which we have done, but solely through faith in the Redeemer's blood. Faith in the Redeemer's blood. So here, now they're saying it's wholly by grace, but solely by faith. Well, which is it? Is it completely by grace or completely by faith? See, you just can't you can't have two things that are that are exclusive exclusive of everything else and say that they're both included. All right? You just can't have that. Now, what we're trying to get you to realize, friends, is your doctrines are contrary to what the Bible is saying because they're based upon a misunderstanding of what the Bible says about grace and faith. Now, here's your Dr. Jerry Carter, he's true to his Baptist doctrine. He true to his Baptist doctrine. He's going to say that it is a gift. I want you to listen to what he says about your salvation by grace through faith. Um, well, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And like I said, please don't under, misunderstand me. I'm not making light of baptism because baptism is very important. But salvation is a gift of God. Now, if a gift of God, if it's a gift, then it's freely given to us without us having to do anything for it. Then adding baptism to salvation is adding works to salvation. Now, now friends, if, if salvation is a gift of God, you don't do anything for it, then he is actually going to eliminate a lot of the verses that he is going to insist are proof of faith only. Now watch this, or, or his version of, of salvation. Consider this. If salvation was by faith only, and it was a gift that God just gave you and whatever, then that's going to eliminate the blood. We just heard the lady call her, call in and said grace only, say by grace, and it's not only. Because our faith, it's going to eliminate the blood. Romans 5 verse 9, we're justified justified uh, by faith, verse 1, look at this, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse 9 says that we're justified by his blood. Romans 5 and verse 9, much more than being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from him through the wrath, uh, saved from wrath through him. So, is it justified by faith only, justified by blood only? What is it? See, you can't say something is only and that it's only a gift and that's all there is to it without eliminating without eliminating something that you, that you know that you're going to have to have. I know that Jerry Carter would not say that you're going to be saved without the blood. All right? But look at this. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, I don't know of anybody that I've ever talked to, especially in the, in the, in the Baptist faith, that says, uh, that tells you how to be saved without quoting Romans 10, 9 and 10. I've got Baptist preachers running out my ears, videos of them saying Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that you, uh, uh, where, there you go, Romans 10, 9, 10, everybody wants this. Thou shalt, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, if you want to say that, that salvation is a free gift and you don't do anything for it, then you're, you just eliminated your two 
most precious verses. You've just eliminated confessing. You've just eliminated believing. Because you just said you don't have to do anything for it. Now, which is it? Do you do nothing for your salvation? Or do you do something in regard to your salvation? The grace that brings salvation appears to all men. And you and I need to understand that there's something that we must do in order to contact that grace. What about this? Uh, uh, Acts 17 verse 30. Paul says that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Now these are just a few things that are connected with salvation that you and I have to do. It's not faith only. It's not just faith only. And you know what they try to do? Then you try to then you hear people say, "Well, faith, and, uh, belief, and repentance are the same thing." No, they're not. Well, well, belief and confession are the same thing. No, they're not the same thing. If they were the same thing, why, why not call them the same thing? They're two different things. And, and they're all required in bringing salvation or receiving the salvation that God's grace brings. Now, redemption is a part of man, or redemption is a result of God's grace. But faithful obedience is what man does. Now, that's what we need to understand, friends. If you, if you are going to receive what God has freely given, then you're going to have to meet the conditions that God has put upon it. Now, we have individuals say, well, I don't think there's any conditions in it. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. This is a gift of God. It's a gift. It's free. You don't do anything for it. You just heard Jerry Carter say that. Here's another man. This is one of my favorite callers, the Waffle Man. Listen to what he says. You on the air. The man just called in. I just want to give reference to where he was coming from. That's Luke, the seventh chapter, 37th verse, down to the 50th. All right, now to top that off, there's another one in Luke, 18th chapter, 37th verse, down to the 43rd verse. This is a blind man. And Jesus said, your sight, uh, Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. Now, I got a question to ask you. Is, sal is salvation a gift? Yes. It's a gift, okay? You don't have to do nothing to earn it at all. All you have to do is receive it. <clears throat> That's what a gift is, as far as I know. When you give a gift at Christmas or whatever, a person don't have to do nothing but reach your hands out and receive it, right? That, that's the gift you're giving. That's the gift who's giving? The one that you're talking about. That's the Christmas gift. The word believe or faith means to trust or depend, right? To believe on Christ means to trust Him completely without reservations, right? You're making your argument. I'm listening to you. Oh, it's not an argument. I'm just telling you you're, what the word You're making an argument. It's okay. What the Bible It's okay. Says. That's not a dirty word. Hey, I know. Okay. Okay. Um, since uh, salvation is a gift, and you don't have to do nothing but receive it, it's nothing. Nobody living today. Now, where, now where's, the says, ago, where's the verse that says it's a gift? It's you, it. Where's the verse that says it's a gift and you don't have to do anything to receive it? Because it's a gift. Now, where's the verse that says you don't and have you, to do anything to receive it? You don't need a verse. Yes, you do need a verse. Hey. Because just because, sir, just because you can give a gift and say, say, here's your Christmas gift, that doesn't mean that all gifts don't come with a condition of you having to do something to get it. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Salvation, I do know this. Salvation came with no strings attached. All right, salvation came with no strings attached. So he says, but here's the thing, friends. If God has given a gift, is it, is it not a free gift even if he says there's something that you're required to do? If you're required to do something in regard to giving, getting a gift, does that mean that it's still not free? See? See? I, I hear people on these radio contests all the time. Radio call, the radio station says, call them, be the 10th caller, and you'll get some tickets to something. So they call in, you know, they, they answer trivia questions, whatever, and they're calling in, and the and radio station, well, you just, you got, you got two free tickets. 
And they said, all right, I got two free tickets. You'd have to come by before the end of the business day to pick them up. Now, wait a minute. They're not free. I have to do something for them. No, they're free. You don't have to pay for them, but you still have to meet some conditions to go and get them. You've got to pick them up before the end of the day. And so the gift is still free. It doesn't change the fact that you are required to do something. Listen, some of you be giving away Christmas presents. All right, you open Christmas presents. You, got, you gave some toys to the kids, right? And on the box it says, batteries not included. Batteries not included. Free gift. You gave it to the child. You gave it to the child. Batteries not included. Do you think that little child is going to say, well, I don't want it because no batteries in it? If you tell the child, you know what? You're going to have to go find some batteries. You're going to have to take some batteries out of your old toy to put in the new toy. You're going to have to go get some batteries out of the box, you know, in the house there and put in your toy because the batteries are not included. Do you think somebody's going to give that toy back because there's no batteries? Are you going to refuse it just because you have to do something? It's still a free gift. It's still a free gift. So just because the batteries aren't included doesn't mean that the gift is not free. Just because God has said, here is the salvation that appears to all men, it's a free gift. Your salvation is a free gift doesn't mean that you don't have to meet some conditions in order to receive that free gift. Hebrews 5 in verse 9 Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says that he became the author of salvation to all who will obey him. Now, does that mean that salvation is not a free gift if man has to do something? You know, I, I think it's interesting that most people have it just backwards about what is really required in regard to man's salvation. They think that God's free gift means that they don't have to lift one finger. Well, we live in a lazy society. I can understand that. We live, we live in a welfare society. Everybody wants to hand out. You know, they, they, don't want, they don't want to do anything for anything. They just want to make sure. They just want it. Give me, give me, give me. Well, that's not the way God's salvation works. His free gift of salvation means that you have to do something. Look. In uh, Joshua 6 and verse 2, God said that I have given you, I have given you the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Does that mean that there was nothing that they had to do to receive it? Does that mean that God had given them and they could just sit there? No. The conditions were you had to march around the city. March around the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, you march around it seven times. You blow the trumpet and give a great shout. And the walls are going to come down and God has given you the city. They had to go take it. Now, was it a free gift? Yes. I've given it to you. But God's salvation is just the way. He says, here's a free gift. Here's what you've got to do to go do it, to, to receive it. That's why faith only is condemned in the Bible. As a matter of fact, a faith only is actually a dead faith. James chapter 2, verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by our works was, uh, was faith made perfect? I'll put this up here. James 2.22. All right. And scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called a friend of God. And you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. By grace you are saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. So who, uh, who has to do something for salvation? Man has to do his part. Grace is God's part through faith. That's man's part. That's man's part. Now, again, I find it interesting that men get it just backwards and want to say you do nothing for your salvation, that God does everything. 
or the things that God says you must do, they say, no, God does that for you. People say, well, God, God grants you repentance. God gives you repentance. Oh, you don't have to do that? Why did God command all men everywhere to repent? You don't have to believe? Oh, no, God gives me the belief. But you add works to salvation, therefore, therefore you're, uh, 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 you're working for your salvation. You, you're bapti you're bap being baptized, so you're working for your salvation. No, friends. You got it just backwards. The things that you say are not works, you know, are works that you do. And the things that you say that I'm doing that are works are the things that God actually does. All right? That's where he actually works. Notice this. Ephesians 2 verse 9, not of works that any man should boast. Now friends, there are different kinds of works that are not works of which man can boast about. In other words, you can do something, you can work, and it still not be something you can boast about. Because it's not something that you have determined you're going to do. You know, you think about this. Men say... We don't believe in work salvation. You say, well, we don't believe in work salvation. But then they turn around and they invent things like the sinner's prayer. Now, that takes some work to invent the sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible. For someone to pray for their sins to be forgiven who are outside of Christ, they're alien sinners, and they're going to pray for their sins to be forgiven, it's not in the Bible. Man has to work to, be, to, to, to uh, uh, invent that. And you want to say that I believe in work salvation? People say, well, you need to get on the mourners, but you need to pray through. And you think, I believe in work salvation? You're the one working it. You want to devise that plan. Someone comes along and says, well, you know, you need to jump and shout and roll and scream and holler and be beat on the back and, and everything until, until, until you get this warm feeling or you, until you get this feeling of the Holy Spirit coming over you. And then you know you're saved. And you say that I believe in work salvation? You're working something that God never said. You've devised a plan that God never talked about, and you want to say that I'm working? I think you need to look in the mirror. You folks are the ones working who have devised all of these plans, innovated all of these plans about how to be saved when they're not in the Bible. When God says to do something, you say, oh, well, that's not a work. But then you turn around and you work harder to find another way to get salvation than you would if you would just do what God said do. John 6, 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now whose work is it? It is a work of God, but man has to do it. Now, I've worked, I've worked uh, with the company before, and the company had a job to do. But the boss says, James, you do this. You do this job. Well, whose job was it? It was the company's job. But I had to do it. When I did it, I was doing the company's work. All right? God said, here's the work that God said for you to do. You have to believe on him whom he hath sent. Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But there are works of righteousness which God says we should do. In other words, we didn't devise our own works of righteousness. We didn't devise our own works that would make us righteous. But we are doing things that God says do in order to be righteous. See, these are, these are how we work. These are the things that we do in order to meet the obligation of God, to meet the conditions for his, for his salvation that he's freely giving. Now, some people want to turn around and say, well, baptism is a work of man. You just heard Jerry Carter say that. Baptism is a work of man. Colossians 2, 11 and 12, this is one of the things that the lady uh, that we talked to last week, one of the verses that we were discussing with her. Notice. In Colossians 2, 11 and 12, In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. The word operation 
is a word translated everywhere else. Everywhere else is translated work or working. And here you are saying, well, God doesn't work. That's a work of man. No, that's actually the very place that God does work. It's in baptism. That's the place where God actually does what you want him to do. And you want to tell me that you believe that you are saved from your sins, that your sins are removed before, before you actually go into the waters of baptism where God does his work? God's the only one that can remove sins. And when you go into the waters of baptism, that's where, that's where you're saved. That's where God removes the sins. You say, well, I'm, I'm saved before I ever get into the water. Well, then you're saved before God ever operates on you. Now, just like the lady, the lady that called in uh, and said, well, you know, I, I had, this, I, I had this, uh, uh, this lump on my breast and I went and went to a doctor. Okay. Well, why did you even go to the doctor? If you can be, if you can be saved or if you can be cured without the doctor, why go to the doctor? If you can be saved from your sins without going to the place where God operates, why even go to God? See, you're actually putting yourself above God. You're actually saying, I can be saved without letting God operate on me. That's where God does his work. Look at this. These are the same words. Same words as, as operation. Ephesians 1.19, according to the working of his mighty power. Ephesians 3.7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift, of, the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. The effectual working of the measure um, of every part maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's all working. And you want to say that you're going to, that you're going to be saved without God doing his work? Now friends, here's salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. God's grace extends salvation. Man's faith actually does something to meet the conditions of that salvation. Faith always works. A living faith always does something. It always works. God is extending salvation. The grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. And man then has to extend his hand in obedience to receive that salvation. Now, is that so hard? Is that so hard? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Uh, Operation of God. Operation of God. Now, friends, who's going to be doing the work? Who's doing the work? Are you saved by grace? Friends, you're not saved by grace only. You're not saved by faith only. You're saved by grace only to the extent that you do what God says to in order to accept the grace that he's freely extended. And you're only saved by faith to the extent that you will faithfully be obedient to him. Now don't say that, you, that you've done nothing for your salvation. Don't say that you have no part in it. You have every part in it. If you refuse the gift, then you don't get it. Don't think that God is going to go through all of this effort to put a plan in place that will save your soul and then... Let you turn around and say, well, I think God's going to save me regardless of what I do. Let me tell you, I don't know, I don't know of anybody in the right mind that thinks that that's the kind of God God is. God is the one who said, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Second Thessalonians 3.10. And you want to turn around and tell me that you're not going to do what God says and expect him to save you? His son died on the cross for the sin of the world. That is that all men might be a partaker or can be partakers of the, uh, of the salvation. And you think that God loves you so much that he's going to save you even when you don't want to obey him? 
Look, if you're not willing to do what God says, why do you think God's going to extend his salvation to you? By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. If you want the gift of God, if you want the salvation that God's grace brings, then why don't you work the works of righteousness that he has commanded? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 15, verse 7. Repent of your sins. Acts 17, verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 36 and 37. Then be baptized for the remission of sins. That is where God operates. It's where he takes away the sin. That's where he, uh, 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 where you die with, with Christ. And then you're raised by the power of God to a, become a new creature. God's grace has been extended. If we can assist you, we want to do that very thing. We're wrapping up. We're, we're out of time. We're going to wrap up. We want you to remember if there's anything that we can do for you, we'll be glad to help you, be of service to you. Here's our contact information. I want to remind you, too, to stay tuned for our religious review. Uh, follow the news tonight. Until then, always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord, and then you can do your own religious review. We'll see you in a little bit. You're watching Real Local WGSR 47.1 in high definition.